Reading 19 from the Psychological Commentaries on the Teaching of Gurdjieff and Ostensky by Maurice Nicole. Volume 2. Birdlet, May 13, 1944. Self Observation. Let me ask you all this question How do you touch life? Well, how do you? It is necessary to realize that each one of you touches life in your own way. Suppose that you have some old-fashioned attitude. Then you touch this so-called modern life, partly through it, and therefore will judge it as if you knew better. But do you see yet that each one of you touches life according to implanted attitudes? Recently, someone asked me why he disliked a certain person. That I could not answer. How could I know why he disliked this person? Later on, he said that he now liked the person. One of the most interesting things in self-observation is to begin to realize that you are always touching life in a certain ingrained way through attitudes and buffers, etc. It is an extraordinary experience to become even a little freer from this acquired way of taking life and taking others. Everyone tightly wrapped up in his or her acquired personality takes things just as he or she does every day. However, with insight into oneself, it is possible to take things in a new way. This is one of the ideas of the work. Must you always take things and people in the same way? Can you change? What does this involve? It always involves a change in oneself. But of course there is nothing wrong with oneself. How difficult it is to realize what the work teaches about this. Are you not all convinced that your views, your judgments, the way you take things and the ways you touch life are right? Yes, of course you are. To realize that you yourself must change is an awkward business. It ceases to be a joke. Yes, the work is serious. It requires an inner self-glance. Not once, but twice. And not twice, but a thousand times to see what this acquired person called yourself is really like, to see that one is often a very narrow, biased, or even unpleasant person. Here, however, we are all sure that we know that we are not unpleasant people. The work is to dissolve this really terrible self-complacency based on pictures, attitudes, and buffers. The work is to break up this maddening suedo creation called yourself, this no doubt proud and charming picture, so deeply rooted to which one is a prisoner, a slave, this acquired machinery that one takes as oneself. I have often thought of what G taught, namely that many moments of self-observation lead at length to whole photographs. This means that the practice of the work leads us to catching real-time photographs of what we are really like and have been like over years and years. This can indeed be shattering. Yes, it is an awkward business to begin to see this. But it is dangerous unless you know how not to become identified, not to be negative. Otherwise, I say it is a very awkward business indeed. This can happen only when you insist on taking yourself as one person, and when, therefore, you attribute everything you observe in yourself to yourself, to something that you call I. The work teaches that this is imaginary I. Of course, if you take everything you observe as I, then you will be in very great difficulties. But as you know, the work begins by teaching you very earnestly that there are many eyes in yourself. 
Unless you can bear to realize this, you cannot do this work beyond a certain point. You cannot separate from yourself, and if this is the case, you cannot really grasp the work. Everything will remain personal. You will be offended. Suppose, for instance, you always identify with the eyes that are against this work. Then you will suffer in a manner that is quite useless. Have you ever really observed and got to know the negative eyes that say all sorts of things and often blaspheme this work? Are you going to say I to them? All sorts and kinds of small, ignorant eyes try to eat us all day long. Do you know what inner separation means? If not, then these small, negative, ignorant, narrow, stupid eyes will eat your work, force like a lot of beetles and mice and rats every day. It is a pity to give them the authority of I, of yourself. You will then be dragged down from the moment you get up in the morning. It is really a tragedy to see a person in the work who really feels and wants the work, quite incapable of realizing different eyes in himself or herself. I say that it is a tragedy for a person not to understand what the work first of all insists on, namely, that we are not one, but many. If you cannot begin to see this, all your work will be in a mess. Every one of you has many eyes which are useless and worse than useless. Everyone has eyes that hate this work because they know they will have to starve and even die. So they fight for their own lives and try to persuade you that they are you. If you say I to them, what can you expect? On the other hand, if you can see them as eyes in you that you do not care for and deliberately decide by experience not to consent to or believe in what they say, then you begin to enter the way of this work even if they overpower you often for the time being. There is a phrase in the work, this is not I. Can you understand what it means? It is interesting to notice how much vanity and pride enter at this point so that a person insists he is fully conscious and knows himself and always acts consciously from a real I. Of course we don't. It is foolish to imagine we do. But it is intelligent to notice that we don't. And this begins work on yourself. It is a very extraordinary experience to begin to undergo this losing of one's imaginary eye. It means a loss of vanity. But it cannot possibly be begun. Indeed, it is not permitted. Unless your valuation of the work is strong enough to hold you up during this loss, this depersonalization, the work can only help you if you have caught hold of its teaching in one point of view, genuinely. That is, so that it can touch and hold you when you have to begin to lose hold of false personality. Let us take persons who regard themselves as solid, consistent men and women. To such people, the idea that they are not one person, but many different persons, often contradictory, will be something abhorrent. They will insist that they know themselves, that they are always one and the same person, and so on. And if any, rather, too transparent contradiction occurs, they will justify themselves. Why? To keep the imaginary idea of themselves intact and inviolate. What a business it is to get a person to realize in this work the existence of many different eyes and to feel their existence in him or her. You recall some of you how some questions were answered in the earlier days of the work. A person, let us say, asks a question like this. I always think that 
the answer was, which I thinks like this. You will agree that it is rather baffling to receive an answer like that. But is it not a real reply? Is it not based on the teaching of the work which begins by telling us that we must realize we are not one eye but many eyes? An answer like that is a real answer. If the above person asks the question in this form, there is a certain I uppermost in me at this moment that appears to think like this. Well, then the answer would be different. It means he is not identified at the moment. But who of us yet can reach the step of seeing clearly that he or she has different eyes, uppermost at different times? Who of us can see yet the turning round of different eyes in ourselves and from that insight not identify with any one of them and not always take them as I, as you, as yourself, solid and permanent? Thinking, imagining we and others are always the same does violence to us and to others. But if you have got as far as not quite taking every psychic event, every viewpoint and thought, state and feeling, as I, as you, then you begin to understand what the work says about inner separation and selection. Some eyes are your friends. Other eyes are your enemies. Some eyes give you force. Other eyes rob you of force and some actually eat you. How then can a person in the work live in a self-complacent sleep, saying I to everything in him or her? Is not all development through a process of rejection and selection? How can you either reject or select if all is one and the same to you? if all is I. If you keep a garden, do you not throw out weeds and cultivate and nourish and tend useful plants? Is it not impossible to do this in your inner life if you take everything as you? You have had thoughts, you have, excuse me, you have bad thoughts or bad feelings. Will you not see that if you take them as I, as you, you strengthen them. Suppose you begin to understand this great teaching of many eyes and of non-identifying with yourself. Well, if you identify with these negative thoughts and feelings coming from these eyes and regard them as I myself, thinking and feeling, where will you get to? Perhaps you will say, yes, but these bad thoughts and feelings are in me, so what can I do? What can you do? You can agree with them, consent to them, identify with them, and give them the authority of I. But supposing that you do not agree with them, consent to them, or identify with them, and do not say I to them, will you get stronger or weaker? Well, think for yourself. Do you think that all these people on the pavement are you? The object of this work is to make us conscious in ourselves and to ourselves, to what is going on in us, to the vast inner traffic of thoughts and feelings that lies within, in the psychic, invisible realm, as distinct from the vast, outer, physical world of things and people that the senses reveal to us. Here in this inner world, and in what we select and reject in it, lies the key to the work, and so to evolution. You all know how to reject and select things in the outer world. You discard useless things from your business and cling to useful things. It is the same idea. Suppose, by long observation, you notice that eyes create moods thoughts and feelings 
that depress you, that eat you, that make you despondent or negative or suspicious or evil-minded, then what are you going to do? Are you going to give such moods, such states, full approval? Are you going to regard them as you? Why should you? If it is pouring with rain, do you remain in it or separate from it? Are you going to practice not identifying with these bad inner states, not going with them, not listening to them? But if you cannot see you are many and insist on regarding yourself as one, then you can do nothing with regard to your inner life. What is this work about? It is to open us to new and better influences coming down from the ray of creation. What is life? It is a machine under certain influences that nourish the moon. You see it at work now. Notice it. Think what it is like. It is not an exceptional state of things that prevails now. It is the ordinary state of things, of life. But the side octave from the sun comes down to us, carrying the possibility of new influences. In that brief spiritual period of ancient Egypt, under Amenhotep, I think, the sun was represented by long rays ending in hands. It did not mean the literal, visible sun, of course, but a higher level of understanding and life, such as that belonging to conscious humanity, not to this violent, greedy, asleep, and chaotic humanity covering the surface of the earth and used almost entirely for cosmic purposes. This is quite understandable. We are already quite familiar with the esoteric teaching, with the work, in that respect. We can easily understand why Amenhotep represented the sun with hands at the end of its rays, reaching towards the earth. But they were never shown, however, as quite reaching the earth. You remember that rope of which the work speaks, to which it is necessary to jump up in order to catch hold of it. Now, if you estimate this work by your practical business eyes or your ordinary pleasure and worldly eyes, you will not be able to rec realize you are not one but many. It requires a trace of magnetic center. It requires a little emotional understanding and not merely formatory proof. How can I prove to you that a strawberry tastes different from an apple? Not by any formatory arguments, I assure you. You must taste and see for yourself. How can I prove to you that to begin to feel the many influences of the work is different from being soaked in life? Of course I cannot, by any formatory argument. Nor can I prove to you that this work is true. If you are holy in life, best not to attempt it. In fact, the work will not seek to touch you. You are then just in life with its horizons. If that satisfies you, then why attempt a new interpretation, a new meaning for existence on this imperfect and violent planet? This work is for those who feel some conviction that life cannot be understood in terms of itself. If you are satisfied with all your experiences, if you feel life is all you need, if you are thoroughly satisfied with yourself, if you are content with everything as yet experienced, then I repeat, why seek this work? But if not, then you must be intelligent enough to connect your dissatisfaction with this work you must begin to be able to realize that your many discontents are not exceptional and catch a glimpse of what the work says about life. How everything happens, how your being attracts what happens to you, and so on. Otherwise, how can the work help you? I would like you to consider what is meant here. 
It is a very deep idea. It is far too easy to become negative and blame others or circumstances. This occurs on all sides. It is the usual life opera. But magnetic center makes a person feel there must be something else. He has an idea there is another opera, not all negative emotion and tragedy. The problem is an inner one. Its solution begins with self-observation according to definite instructions. So unless you can observe yourself, the work remains dead. In order to observe yourself, it is necessary to realize that you are not one, but many. Unless you can see, eventually, different eyes in yourself, you cannot reject or select. And without the work and the understanding of what it is about, you will not be able, eventually, to reject and select rightly. But if this is done, new influences begin to enter your inner life. You begin to feel the beginning of new life, and very gracious it is. If you listen to it, something begins to grow. If you know when you are out of touch with it, and feel a deprivation, and seek it again, then it will return again. For a long time, and inevitably, one swings between the old and the new. It is a question of inner valuation of that strange thing called will, which is like turning without violence in one direction, in spite of upsets, like a magnetic needle. But all this, all the beginning of this octave we spoke of, that creates new energies. I say all this remains almost impossible if you say I to everything in yourself. Then one is in total darkness as in the opening verses of Genesis. Light is not yet divided from darkness. Now I would like some of you especially to notice eyes that eat your force. Recently I had a plague of them and for a time did not notice them. I took these thoughts and words and feelings as I. That is, I was asleep. You are, each of you, surrounded inside with negative, weak, carping, poor, suspicious, narrow, stupid eyes. Some of them have gained great strength by long habitual consent to them. You observe a person. He or she suddenly loses force, becomes weak, negative, lost, and so on. What has happened? Some eye is eating that person. Our inner life is far more dangerous than our outer life and its dangers. Now you must understand, all of you, that this doctrine of eyes does not relieve you of all responsibility. Only a fool can imagine that. To reject eyes or to select eyes is a very real thing. To go with wrong eyes must give you real pain, real suffering. This is useful suffering. You must learn to hate eyes in yourself. Otherwise, you will make the work trivial, an excuse for doing just what you want. There are periods when the work comes down very hard on you. Then it passes for a time. But if it never comes down hard on you, you may be sure it is not willing to touch you. Last year I was told a dream by someone not here now. This person dreamt that all his uncles and aunts, his mother, his father, sisters, brothers, were standing round him. He was lying in bed, dying and almost dead. All these people were in deep black. I entered the room looking very thin and ill and pale, and then left in a hurry without looking directly at him. Well, here you see an emotional parable picture of this person's inner state. All the acquired life eyes surround him. He is dying. The work enters, but in a very poor way, and leaves hurriedly. Perhaps this will show you why this person died as far as the work is concerned. He had in himself 
no free power of choice. In a way, he saw the work, but his eyes were too strong. Remember, the work is exactly as strong in you as you allow it to be. It is a question of valuation.